Hello fellow gamers and welcome back. I'm as always Captain Sedaris. And here's Seven Zeron. Joining us today is Sander Jero, the community leader of Star Trek Birth of the Federation. Hi, how are you doing today? Before we start with the main topic, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? How did you get into the Star Trek franchise and into the game? Uh, well, I've always been a fan of Star Trek. My brother ended up getting the game when it first came out, and we started playing a little bit of multiplayer. I really enjoyed it. We played for several years after that. I found the uh, Armada Fleet Command Forum, and I started getting into a little bit of modding. Uh, shortly after that, uh, there were some problems with the site, and uh, I ended up contacting the original owner of the site and ended up taking it over from him. And uh, since then, I've just been enjoying it and hoping other people enjoy it as well. Well, as you can guess, today we have a look at Star Trek Birth of the Federation, a turn-based strategy game from the year 1999. Similar to Civilization or Master of Orion, you control one of five empires, the Federation, Klingons, Romulans, Cardassian and Ferengi. Sadly I have to report that it's very hard to play under Windows 10, but luckily you can download a backup version from Armada Fleet Command which was updated and with that you can play not only on Windows 10 but also in widescreen. At this point I would like the opportunity to ask you directly, was it hard to create the widescreen support? It was very difficult. Me and a couple members uh, had to work on looking at all the files and the coding for it. found many files that have to be edited. It's about a hundred files per resolution that we do. We have to do multiple resolutions and each one has to be done individually. Then after we get all those, you still have to get each individual image edited to that resolution. So after each resolution, you have to move to the next resolution and the next resolution. and that is why we have so many limited resolutions. I realize most games it's just real simple. It just enlarge the have a program to enlarge the uh, images and goes from there. But this program will not allow that type of editing. But it is very difficult to do. It is an extreme endeavor just to make even just one resolution change. This game is never meant to be modded. <laughs> But it explains a lot because I was really scratching my head thinking why is the guy only doing full HD, what's with the other resolutions, but knowing this, it sounds naturally because it would be a lot to ask to put in that amount of effort. Uh, that's why the uh, purchase version for the HD, the 1920, it's just a generic, it doesn't have all the little bells and whistles that all the other ones had. The other ones we did spend a little bit more time on the uh, 1024 and the 1366. And then once you start enlarging all those images, then it just doesn't look as good anymore, I don't think, at least in my opinion. Because everything is very limited to the quality or the type of image that it has uses also. I can't put a high quality ping in there or a good quality picture in there because the game just won't accept them actually uses a 16-bit tag image that is very, very low quality to even start with. So that's another issue when you're trying to increase the resolution. I guess this aspect also is more or less in the multiplayer section of the game. Yeah. The original version of the game was supported by the MSN Gaming Zone, which is after 2006 gone. So a long time has passed since then. Nowadays, the best way to play it is, of course, Game Ranger or a VPN. Uh, you can do a direct connection. Uh, it is difficult. And of course, whenever you do a direct connection, you're giving the person your IP. So you only want to do that with somebody you know very well and trust. <laughs> and for some reason, I never could get the, the connection stable. Either I couldn't find the other player or we went out of sync very fast. So I only used Game Ranger. Yeah, it is difficult when you're it has a lot of protocols and the game file is transferred between the two players so much it's that's where i think it loses a lot of its sync and also that we found out there's a as far as the game going out of sync buttons are very touchy especially the turn button if you push it more than once while you're waiting for the other one it will actually put two turns on you and that's why it puts it out of sync no yes Unbelievable. Yes, it is. Uh, there is no way that we've ever found to stop that. It's kind of tough. It's unbelievable that the game is even still played anymore, to be honest, sometimes. 
but uh, it's very enjoyable in single player. And once you get used to how you have to wait and be very patient on the multiplayer, it gets a little bit more stable. You know, it's like there's a couple of guys, they play Ultimate Dominion mod constantly. They'll go 200 turns without ever having a single crash or going out of sync because they are just so used to each other and how they play. They will it just goes on forever for them. As I say, you just have to be patient with the game. A good place to find other players is, of course, the Armada Fleet Command forum or Discord server. As the community leader, could you tell us a little bit about your community? It's a very small community, really. We get members in and out quite a bit. I would say there's probably about two to three hundred members that are regulars. But you'll have members coming in and out all the time that will ask a question here and there, but then you'll never hear from them again. So we have quite a few members on our list, but like I said, there's probably only about 200 that are regular members. Uh, it's going for so long. I, I came in about 2006. AFC started it in 2002. And the reason he started the forum was he saw so many of the other sites that supported Birth of the Federation just collapsing at the time and becoming non-existent anymore. Uh, he was a big fan of Armada, Armada 1 and Armada 2. And that was the original site was what it was for. And when he did that, everybody came there. It just built from there. It's kind of amazing how much back in the days, difference between now and then. <laughs> We would have an average, you know, two to three thousand people per day. Where nowadays we only, like I say, have about two hundred that would visit regularly. Which isn't actually a bad number, considering that the game is more than twenty years old. So actually, I wouldn't feel bad about that at all. Yeah, it is. Also, if you compare it to the other Star Trek communities, it's quite a huge number. I've heard that. I, I've not really been into many of the other communities that much. I know that's like Armada. When I took it away or got the site from AFC, I did promise him I would keep his Armada site going for him. Even though the Armada site right now is very slow, with, they're usually only getting maybe five to ten visitors a day right now, unfortunately. They do have other outlets for forums and development such as that on other places. A lot of people still use it as a great place for information, and it does have a lot of information in there for them. Just like our site has but sadly, I have to say it's the only Amada website which is still up. We have, of course, a few modding sites, but a, a community forum, I would say it's the only one. Yeah, and a lot of them, like you say, it is a lot of modding sites, and they're using, they're more using those, it seems like, instead of coming here to our uh, AFC. Uh, but yeah, it is a different community. <laughs> I had never really been involved in any forums before this one, so. It was kind of a new experience when I started. In fact, when I did start modding was basically the reason I went to AFC. I noticed a small post and I responded to the owner of the post. It was actually, he was no longer interested in uh, Uncivil Wars mod. When I did that, I took it over from him. He gave me all of his files. Uh, it got me really started and really involved into modding. And after that, I ended up getting in a lot of trouble with some of the other modders. <laughs> I, I bumped a few heads, I would say, and it kind of got me a lot of attention. Uh, but we ended up working out all of our issues. I learned real quick that what to do and what not to do. And, <laughs> and it, was, it was interesting, to say the least, at first. But then after that, FC basically just disappeared off the planet. And... I ended up trying to find him, contacted him. The site actually went down for like three weeks. I was basically the only one who contacted him saying, what's going on? And he ended up uh, making me administrator at that point. And about five years later, he ended up uh, just signing the URL over to me. And I took it over and I've been running it ever since. Are you still in contact with him? Uh, actually, I got a text message from him about a month ago. He was asking for a few files. I sent them to him. He was happy. and <laughs> He never really did talk much. Uh, like I said, he wasn't much into Birth of the Federation. He did that more just because he almost felt sorry for him because of all the site closures, like I said. And he realizes right now that Armada 
has very little support anymore. I haven't even seen a mod or even a file in probably five years for a mod of any new files or any new ships or anything like that. So but I think he was just kind of wanting to a little nostalgia and went back and played a few games and probably that was it, I'm sure. Yeah, I can relate to that at least. Uh, and that seems like a lot of our members will come back, play a little bit for nostalgia, just for the memories. As a lot of people do have quick memories of playing it when they're young or playing it with someone or, you know, so they just come back, play for a little bit, and see what's new and try out some of the new stuff. We already talked a little bit, of course, of the history of the game, but a few more side notes. The game was developed by Microprose, which also made Civilization 1 and 2. And they were involved in the publishing of Master of Orion. Many critics even say Birth of the Federation is an unofficial sequel to the Orion games. And don't uh, forget the XCOM series, the original one from the 90s. It's also yeah. from my pros. Oh, I missed that somehow. Yeah, not really familiar with the games much. I've heard of them. I've never actually played them. I never owned them myself. So I, and I've actually heard that too as well. But there's some interesting things that I've actually learned about Birth of the Federation it was kind of being developed parallel to Falcon 4. They even used the Falcon 4 graphic engine on Birth of the Federation. And uh, also they did not, I don't think from what I heard, Falcon 4 was not happy about that either. So, because <laughs> they were actually two separate sites. One was like in New York and one was in California. You know, Falcon 4 was, I think, New York and California was Birth of the Federation. And they were kind of not really happy with each other from what I understood, from what I've talked to a few of the developers over the years. But it was kind of interesting. And it was so much at the end of Micropose when Birth of the Federation came out. They were a very bad place on both locations. They were getting ready to close up. I think both of them sell. They knew it was going to sell, so they wanted to rush both of them out as quickly as possible just to get as many sales as possible before the sale. And it was very shortly, I think it was less than six months after they put out Birth of the Federation, that both of them were sold to, I believe it was Activision. Activision actually put out a couple patches for both of them. And I think Micropose put out one real quick patch. But Activision put out a second patch for Birth of the Federation. They did quite a few patches, I think, for Falcon 4. They seem to have a lot more interest in that. What's really strange is, after Activision, it was sold again to another company. I'm not exactly sure the name of the company. And it basically got lost after that. I don't know where the sale went to, and nobody really claims it anymore as far as who owns the actual rights to the game. Because I think that other little company closed up and all the files, information that we would love to have is all gone now. So it's like Falcon 4's source code was actually leaked, I believe when it was in possession of Activision. But source code for Birth of the Federation was never released in any way or leaked or whatever you want to call it. That's why Falcon 4 has been Actually, they have gone through, they have made so many changes. They were able to correct all the memory leaks. They did a lot of changes and repairs on it. Just in the Falcon 4 community was able to do this. After you know, 10 years, they were still making changes and updates on it. Where since we didn't have the source code, we couldn't do anything like that. We were ended up working from the X code, which is very difficult to do. And would you say with the source code, you could fix a lot of the problems from the game? Oh, yes. If we had a source code, it could be fixed. But the problem is there is no source code. I've even talked to several of the original developers in Micropose. They are very short in talking to them. But they basically say they don't have a copy and they don't know where any is. <laughs> and I think a lot of that's because of the copyrights and such as that. They don't want to, you know, they couldn't really do anything even if they probably did. Because like I said, the Falcon code was actually leaked by mistake. Someone left the server open or and somebody just happened to find it. <laughs> it was back before a lot of the heavy firewalls that they have now <laughs> on those sites. Also, something interesting to mention is that Microprose did only have the rights for Next Generation and didn't have the rights for the original series DS9 or Voyager. Yes, uh, that was very complicated. I even talked to uh, one of the... I think she called herself the Star Trek liaison that did all the communications for the copyright. 
And she said there was a lot of back and forth. They were able to get some of it due to crossover episodes and the movie. They were able to sneak a little bit of the content in. Yeah, like the Defiant. And the Sovereign, you know, things like that. Yeah, they did get to sneak in, but he didn't want them to use the Dominion or anything else. And I think that's where they drew the line is like, okay, Dominions or uh, <laughs> guess 9 and we have the rights to next generation. But so uh, there's like, a lot of content in the game, I believe. I mean, yeah, of course you could enrich the entire game with more content from different shows, but as someone who hasn't really played the game a lot, uh, but is a little bit into Star Trek, I found they did a lot with this, so to say, limited content. Uh, still, they yeah. did a whole lot of it. Yes, they did. I would also say they wouldn't need DS9 and Voyager, but TOS would really be nice to have the progress, especially if you now include Enterprise. So from the first Warp 5 ship to the Enterprise D, that would be a nice pass, I would say. Yeah, there has been a few mods that did try to attempt that. Uh, one of them is All Ages mod. We tried to really incorporate the original series, uh, ships and content like that, that he tried to do. There was another one that was in the works, but never ended up getting completed. And I don't even have a copy of it. Like I say, it's nice that some of them have tried to do it because we do have the ships for it. And that was another story right there. Just getting the ships into the game was a very difficult undertaking by a lot of very experienced modders that we had early on in the early years. They worked on that for about three years before they were able to actually get it to work, before we could even get a ship added to anything. That was about the time that I showed up there. It was kind of good timing on my part, though. But it shows how creative the Star Trek community always is. Yes, it does. They were very creative. And I would estimate there's probably really only of uh, the coders that actually made the major changes we probably only had about 25 to 30 of them there wasn't many of them that actually were able to make those major changes to add the new ships to increase how many ships we could have because originally it was very block set you could only have so many ships you know you could only have so many of this, we never were able to increase the races, but we were able to change the races. That was another difficult thing. And there were so many difficult things to do. Major last one that we had was actually increasing the tech levels, so we could increase tech levels. Right now, I think it's about 25 is the highest anybody's gone. I don't know if there's actually a limit to it or not, but the coding that's there wouldn't surprise me if it, that's probably about the max that we could have. But that's as far as we've actually done it. I guess here having the source code would also help. Oh yes, that would make anything possible pretty much. Once you had, if you had that, but like I said, that's something that we know is never going to happen. You know, that's the problem. We know it'll never happen. But there has been people try and try, people ask constantly. I'd love to say, yeah, eventually we'll get it, but I know it will never happen. On the credits list at the end, I have actually gone through that and tried to contact each and every one of them on there. And it just doesn't work. They just don't want to, or don't have it, or it's just gone. I have a feeling it's the latter, it's just gone. But the transfers from so many places that it went, as I said, I think it actually was sold three times total. And by the time it got to that third one, I'm not even sure if they even got the source code. They made no changes. It was a bulk deal that they bought like 50 games all at once that did nothing with them. I think they bought all of them for one game. I'm not even sure which game that was. It might have been Falcon 4, but I'm not sure. And that's like the new Micropose. It is, I believe it's in Australia now. They actually have a uh, Facebook page that I actually keep an eye on. They actually, I think, bought back the rights to Falcon 4. I'm not 100% sure of it, but. They're trying to build back all their old games, but the Federation is not one of them because I think this is the, like I said, when I was talking about the two East Coast, West Coast, I think this is like the East Coast that ran Falcon 4. They're not interested in anything that the other development did. It's kind of sad, but I think that's kind of what they did. They just tried to get back most of their games. Most of theirs are war, tactical combat, you know, that type of game. I think right now, I think they're working on something 
battleship or something that they're doing. Or something completely different. Yes. But sounds like you did a lot of digging on the internet to find the connections to the old developers. Oh yes, uh, it was a lot of it was basically through Facebook, con contacting through them, going through names and such as that. But uh, they're still around. But like I say, a lot of them are in different companies. Some of them are still went to Activision. Some of them just out on their own. Matter of fact, I even tried to contact some of the old because uh, they have a list of beta testers the credits they even tried to contact some of the beta testers and i'm curious how was the response of the developers and beta testers when you approached them via facebook very limited they were very limited uh like i said the one that i did get was the uh star trek liaison she was very nice talked quite a bit with me uh we talked probably for a couple hours she was kind of interested in what was going on but there's really not much information she could give <laughs> You know, a little bit of background, like I say, on the uh, conflicts that they had just using the next generation content. That was mainly what she was talking about. But it was kind of interesting to talk to her. Uh, the main developers and such as that, a lot of them, they just never even would respond, which is, you know, kind of sad. But the ones that did, they were just kind of like, oh, that's cool. Okay, have fun. Bye. <laughs> Yeah, you know, they weren't interested in the game anymore, unfortunately. I wish they were, but I, and if they are, they're, they want to be known as one of the developers if they are interested in the game, because they may be on the forum. I don't know. You know, that's one thing about the forum, you don't know exactly who it is. Yeah, they could hide behind any username. Exactly. I think they were really rushed on it, I think that was really a shame. I think if they had more time, I think this game could have been a lot better. But the time that they had, I'm not exactly sure exactly what was going on with Micropose, but it was just really sad that they did have to rush it out. And How much time just, did they have actually? Um... I think they started work on it in 97, from what I've seen of some of the file dates. So I mean, they worked on it a couple of years. I don't think they were really ready when they did release it. There's just so many things that they could have done differently. Uh, we had a lot of what the coders are calling unused code they actually have the plasma torpedo files and we actually found the plasma code in the game it was turned off and there's several little things like that that was turned off that you could see they were planning on using but never had the time to actually develop everything that was needed or it had an issue or what have you and it was kind of sad that we know that it's there and you really can't activate it properly. Uh, we were able to turn on the plasma, but the graphic engine would not display them correctly. And there's no way to edit the graphic engine to do it what it needs to do without that source code or being able to have the time to go through and basically recode the whole section. And the way we're doing it, we only have so many bytes that you can edit. So if you need 200 bytes and you only have 20 bytes there, there's nothing you can do. We're limited on space on how much we can edit and put in there. So essentially was, the only way to actually get some improvement somehow would be basically redoing the engine with an open source project or something like that. Yes, exactly. And like I say, it's just not going to happen. <laughs> After so many years, we've had several people that have even tried to recreate the game from scratch. We had one coder that started it. He actually had a lot of luck comparing the game, because like I said, it is so much similar, the code that is used to Falcon 4. He was using it as a template, trying to reset everything, their source code, adding our code to it, and he ended up giving up after about a year and a half. Closest he got was able to play a few screens and that was about it he never had any working buttons or anything like that it was very tough to get anything to go and it just ended up he just wasn't able to get anywhere with it unfortunately i think if he had the time it's a question of how crazy the guy actually is i mean there are people out there who really pull all-nighters just for their private coding projects and sometimes you can't get enough done to see real results it's too complicated yeah. And he did that, I know, many times. 
and he's made some great modifications for us. That was kind of his side project was actually to try to recreate the game in source code. It's his original project when he came. He actually gave us the code to increase the task force. It ended up semi-failing because we had to limit the AI to one ship in a task force. But the human player could end up getting 18 instead of the original nine. So he was able to double it. It ended up limiting, like I say, the AI. So it was kind of a work, but mm, the AI is a little crippled now. <laughs> so it didn't work as well as he wanted it to. He was kind of disappointed in that. And like I said, after so many tries, it got very difficult. He was actually the one that created all the code for the resolutions increases. So he did quite a few great projects, but that one he was never able to complete. Uh, I wish I could have got the files from him, but he didn't want to give them to me. <laughs> That's one thing I am. I think one reason I keep the site alive is I am a file junkie. I keep every file that I get. <laughs> yeah, no, this, <laughs> I, I call myself a data messy. It's just like that. I don't throw things away. I have probably about five hard drives sitting right beside me right now. There's just nothing but files from this thing. <laughs> I have access to everything on the site, so that kind of helped to start with. Uh, and I've had all of them through over the years. Now, another thing that we have also, we have another one that is, he's still in the works. He's actually trying to replace the entire graphic engine. It's called NPR Plus. And he actually has a working prototype of it. It takes all new type ships as far as the format for the ships. They're in great detail. We've got new lighting on it. And it works rather well. Uh, but it's it's kind of a stalled project. The real life has taken over for him and hasn't been able to get back to it in several years. But it is still a working project right now. Yeah, it looks amazing. I saw screenshots and a few videos on YouTube. It's a lot of work. Yes, it is. He put a lot of work into it and uh, integrating it with... Right now, he's just using his graphic engine, but he's still using this original code to operate the ships, you use the commands and everything. It's still, still all the original code. Just replace the graphic engine. He had a lot of plans originally for adding what he calls injecting code. So it wouldn't limit us, but it, we do have some options there, but most people don't understand it, including myself. <laughs> I've never actually been a coder. I've never made any major changes myself. I'll make a little small changes here and there, but I was always collected everything and had everything out for everybody else. <laughs> Since you're already so deep in the subject of modding, you also did a lot of work for the Ultimate Dominion mod. How did this start? That was actually shortly after I started the original, or I shouldn't say the original, because there's been three different versions of Ultimate Dominion mod by s several different creators. When I came in, the creator was Ziggy. He saw me working on Uncivil Wars, uh, liked what I was doing, adding the ships. I was actually doing some ship creation myself at the time. He kind of took me under his wing and kind of taught me a little bit more about how to make my ships better, do the textures a little better, and how to make them look less transparent, because if you don't do them right, you'll actually make the ships look transparent, and they look kind of strange, to say the least, if you don't do them quite right. He kind of taught me a little bit about that. We ended up working together on Ultimate Dominion 3 for probably about two years. And because we were just basically still in the prototype beta stage, whatever you want to call it, uh, just putting out little patches here and there, just letting people test and give us feedback and everything else. But all of a sudden, I talked to him one day. He said he was having a headache and he'd probably get back to me in a couple weeks. And I never heard from him again. I have no idea what happened to him. I hope that he's fine. I really do. Uh, he said he was going to go into for a surgery uh, for his headaches, and that was the last I heard from him, unfortunately. And after that, I took over the mod. He had a very specific outline for what he wanted in the mod. I tried to keep it to that in honor of him. Uh, he wanted every ship replaced. He wanted smooth balance of the ship's stats. I tried to keep it to that, and basically once I got it released, I haven't made much changes from that, just because I still consider it his mod, even though I ended up completing it. And I don't know 
that ever happened to him. And then I, I, like I say, I wish him the best wherever he's at. That sounds really tough. Yeah. And that happens, unfortunately, with a lot of them. I have seen so many mods, people will start. It is so tricky seeing all the little details and everything together. A lot of them, unfortunately, do not get completed. Yeah, th that and, and I meant it's tough working with somebody who is dropping basically off the earth. So no contact, nothing. Yeah, it is. Most of the time, most modders are doing it by themselves. That was just one of those unusual ones that I've had that I actually had a partner with. Uh, that's like I just completed a mod, a uh, Mirror Universe mod. I just released this summer, matter of fact. Uh, it's one of the more stable. As I've learned going ahead, I've learned what code not to add with this code, what code to add with this code, and I think it ended up one of the better mods in my opinion. It's more alternate universe, which I think actually turned a lot of users off. Didn't like not having the original United Federation of Planets. <laughs> Unfortunately, but it is a fun game to play. You don't have to worry about the morale problems that you have with the Federation of Planets. If you go into war with the Federation of Planets, you'll destroy your morale real quick. But this one, it won't. <laughs> it's open to battle. I tried to keep the ships more limited and get them a lot more balanced, and I think it ended up being a very stable mod. But actually, in my opinion, it's one of my favorites, personally. I will definitely try it. We already touched the subject a little bit, but you also made a kind of backup version of the game and included all the mods. How complicated was that? It took a lot of learning. It was a learning curve. Originally, that was one thing that got me in trouble when I first started in the game. There was a user, a member called Joker. He created a installer and just took a small file, added it to the original version to make the mod. I ended up changing a little bit of his codes to meet my needs and didn't like me changing his code and <laughs> but like I said we ended up working out our problems and he was actually happy with a lot of the changes that I made to that original installer but after that that's kind of what got me into the in creating the installer it was basically for mods only this is not play the original version the installer really isn't and you should own the original game I even have that in the user agreement that you should own the original game before installing this, just for the copyright laws and everything else. So I don't have the rights to it, unfortunately. I wish I could. I could never afford them, but like I said, it's mainly for the mods, for people to be able to install the mods without getting conflict. Every time someone would play in multiplayer games, it uses uh, your registry settings, it has to read the INI file, and if those files don't match exactly, byte for byte, you will get an immediate crash in multiplayer. So I had a lot of people saying, well, how can we fix the multiplayer so I can play a mod in multiplayer? So I, we ended up going through with a lot of the coders. I talked to all of them, trying to get everything that we needed, and finally got everything as far as the registries that's required. And after that, it started going from that little installer that Joker had. Ended up using uh, another installer. It's a free installer. It's open source. Uh, it's called Enos. And ended up trying to find out how I could get everything together and get everything all at once. It ended up being just a long list of if you don't have this here or this here or this here in this order, it doesn't work. Okay, let's test this, this. <laughs> and it took a lot of time. The original one, we went through about three different stages of the installer after the Joker one that I did. And one was called the multi-installer before I made the all-in-one. And it just did individual mods. It would have a mod would read a backup file that the original made to add it to a new uh, install path and it would make all the registries. But people were getting frustrated with it because they were wanting to add all the different resolutions because that started coming out at that time. And it just ended up snowballing into what we have now. <laughs> and it took, right now, 
installer has, I think, over like 3,000 lines now. Just with all the different files, protocols, what files go with what, what file has to overwrite what file to get this resolution, what file has to be replaced with the Trek EX because of this resolution and this resolution or this mod. And it's I'm amazed half the time that it works, but it, it has actually worked rather well. Yeah, and I think you're completely right. It really works well. For someone who doesn't want to have to fiddle around with stuff like that and just wants to get the game going, it really works quite nicely, actually. And you can go through the forum. There's probably, I think it's like 15 or 20 pages of just building that first all-in-one. Talking to people, people testing it, telling me what problems they're having here, what problems they're having here, what's not working, what's working, before we actually got it right. <laughs> or I should say I got it right, unfortunately. There wasn't much help on that as far as assembling. I did have some help from a few of the coders that I had to get some specialty codes for as it progressed. Uh, when Windows 10 came into the issue, we were just dead in the water there for a while. The only thing that the game would even run on for about six months was NPR. That was the only thing that would run it. And that was one reason why he rushed it out at that time, so people could play the game again. Because Windows 10 completely killed it. It would not function hardly at all. Once we added the MPR to it, it would work again. So I ended up finding the other DX window program there, and it worked real well. I ended up incorporating that into the installer. I talked to the developer of that. He had no problem with it, incorporating it in there. And that, I think, was... The only saving grace for this game right now, or it probably would have been dead about four years ago. I don't think it would have survived only being able to play on NPR, because NPR is very limited on what mods are available for it. And you did a good job, I think. It works like charm. Thank you. Yeah, I think it works even better as the release version, because I remember back then you could play maybe 80 to 90 rounds, then you had the memory leak and it was a slideshow more or less. I know. That was one reason why I went to talk to some of the beta testers. Beta release didn't have the memory limitations. I was hoping to get the original game from the beta release. We have never once seen a message, it's a coded message inside the game saying, we're out of memory. No one has ever seen it because they actually put in a program called Smart Heap that limits the memory. And that is one of the main things that is slowing our game down, even with the great systems we have nowadays. I think if I would have got, been able to get one of those beta versions, it would have been very nice to see what it would actually had. because it was actually running out of memory when they were testing it with the beta versions. But I've never found one. <laughs> never found a copy of it. It's always fascinating for me how different sometimes the beta version is to the release version. I would have liked to have seen what they also had in that too. <laughs> Life could have been just about everything. Yeah, what hidden features. Mm -hmm. And they may have actually tried to have the other torpedoes and who knows what all they could have had in there. Uh, actually, there was one other feature that wasn't in the game was the, uh, I think it was probably taken out because of the contractor game for next generation was they actually had the cone from the original series. I can't even think of the name of it now. The, uh, Doomsday Machine, excuse me. Doomsday. Oh, they wanted to include that? Oh, that would be nice. Actually, it is, has been included into Error Correction Mod. They actually got all the code and added it back in as one of the monsters. Oh, crap. I see my holidays. My holidays are basically gone now. I have to test all these mods. <laughs> he actually added a new monster to it. He didn't replace one of them. Like many, like Ultimate Dominion Mod, we've replaced the to move with the Hisnock and such as that. You know, we've had changes like that. We put in, uh, what is it, species? I can't even think of the number now. <laughs> From Voyager. Uh, species 8472. 8472, that's it. We added that into the Dominion mod. And a few other mods have also added it in. Uh, so we've changed them, but he was the first one to actually new add a new that's monster. Really nice. I have to try it. But moving along, I would say, let's go to the pros. Uh, pros of the game, I think, to me, it's more being able to build, take your time, get 
the systems into the way that you want them. It's just a different platform for most games that you see out there. As for me, I, I really like that a lot. Just being individual, you can take your time. There's no time limit on your turn. Just seeing how you progress, I, I really love that it had the 3D combat, even though it's not real true 3D combat. <laughs> but for the time, for 1999, it was actually pretty good. Yeah, I also love this Trek feeling, this big galactic feeling, I would have to say, where also every empire plays different. So as the Federation, you have to be the peaceful player. You have to use diplomacy instead of combat. As the Klingon, you have to use combat and not diplomacy. Uh-huh, yes. I've played, of course, all races. And personally, I think my favorite is the Klingons. I like to go in and just crush everything. <laughs> That is always a fun part to me. And I love a lot of their ships, and I like the ability to cloak. It always gives you a little bit of an advantage. And like you say, every race has a little different. You, know, you have the intel from the Cardassians. You have the intel and cloaking on the Romulans. Add out attack on the Klingons. The Federation, you can get your miners and get more. They have better credits, you know. You can build more ships. But... Like I say, everything is just so different when you're playing each individual race. As an expert, would you say the game is good balanced? I never could answer that for myself, but having you here, I would like to hear your answer. The original game, no. It really wasn't. There's a lot of players, including myself, that say the Klingons, multiplayer, if you're going head on head on somebody, they'll pretty much kill you every time. There's a few players out there that say, Federation will actually kill you head to head. So I think those are, eight, I think, what they say is most balanced between the two. The Federation can almost overcome the Klingon cloak. Romulans are a little weaker ships, but I, I think that's a lot of the what people love about the game. You can take that disadvantage and still win. And even with anything that's out there, you can still do it. And I've won from every race. I've lost from every race, too. <laughs> so... <laughs> If you get in too much of a rush and be caught off guard, you will lose. And I think that's one thing that a lot of people don't like. They don't want to lose. <laughs> also, it's interesting that in some rounds of the game, you can't even win because the Borg invasion is coming so huge, so in force that you basically have lost. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is possible. And this is also, I think, a, a very strong pro for me. Because the Borg are always such a weak faction in the other games. And here they are really a threat. You really have to deal with them. And they can kick your ass. Oh yes. The only ones that really don't have problem with the Borg is the Klingons. They have the cloak ships. They get that advantage. You can take out a Borg cube usually with nine and cruisers real easy. If you're early in the game and you hit the Borg, a lot of people will just say it ruins it. It doesn't ruin it, you lose. You know, in my opinion. I don't ever think it's ruined, you lose. And that's one thing that I actually do like about the game. It makes you try harder, it makes you go back and say, okay, what can I do different? Yeah, much like the original XCOM experience. You can lose the game, actually, you can mess up things, so it's not just a, a joy ride. Yeah, and if you sit there and just build just a couple of cities, it will actually go against you. Even though those two are the strongest planets in the system, it doesn't matter if they've got 20 of them. You know, so, and they'll come after you, and they will come after you real hard sometimes, especially when you're doing the impossible setting. And it's funny, it's somehow something which I'm not mad about. I, I really don't have a problem to lose against the Borg. Because I think in, in canon, at least, they are really such a big threat that it's okay. And it's fun, basically, to lose against them. <laughs> they can make the game interesting, I know that. Personally, I've never really been that much fan of the Borg itself. I, I play with them occasionally. The only reason, I like confronting them. I don't like when they confront the AI and destroy the AI. Before I can. <laughs> You know, I want to be the one that's taking on the Klingons and the Cardassians. I don't want the Borg to wipe them out before I get there. <laughs> yeah, I can understand that. So, Saturn, maybe you give us your pros. It's, it's a turn-based game, basically. This is 
in my opinion, a pro. There are a lot of games out there where you have to hurry your decisions and running from one problem to the next and never getting to catch your breath. And uh, this actually, as you already said, is different with this game. You can take your time and think about what you are about to do. This is something I actually like in the game. And today there are very few turn-based games. Back then there were a lot more. So kind of got a little bit lost over time. And, and I actually like this kind of game, especially because it is kind of a roguelike game. You have a galaxy or a map created randomly. The factions are random. You never know what is going to happen next. So every um, match is differently. This is something I, I really like in the game. So you cannot just go over the same old tactic. Let's take, for example, Dungeon Keeper. If you know the missions, you simply know what to do. And here you can end up with, with a situation you know nothing about, and which can, as we discussed a few moments ago, also bring you in a position where you're getting your ass handed. And yeah, that's important for a game, I believe, that it can surprise you, that it can be fun even after the 50th match or something like that. And still, the concept is rather easily understandable and the mechanics isn't too difficult. And yeah. And what I specifically find nice in this turn-based game is parallel gaming. I mean, there are a lot of games uh, from back then where you have turn-based gameplay, but you are always playing one at a time. If you take, for example, Warlords, or if you take the UFO 2000 player versus player game, then usually those games tend to be one player at a time which means if you're playing with, let's say, four players, all the rounds will take a whole lot of time. They did it better. You are playing actually parallel, and it, when everyone has finished setting up the turn, then the game goes on next turn, but you don't have to wait for all the other guys. At least not one at a time, but it's actually the guy who takes the longest that sets the time that you have to wait. I find that a nice touch. And if you really want to multiplayer, a lot of them they get frustrated. They'll put a time limit on some people. Yeah. So you got 10 minutes, 15 minutes. There is actually that option to set that in the game and it will turn on its own. Yeah, yeah this, this is an important aspect, especially if you play competitive. If you wouldn't do it like that and for competitive gameplay, this would break the game because if you feel you are losing, well, then you just never hit the end turn button. And yeah. well, let mm -hmm. the other guy drop out of the game. But yeah. they thought about this, which I find also important. Yeah, it's a, it's a nice idea. There are many games that do this, which have understood that, but there are also development teams that didn't have the idea and it can spoil the game. And of course, what I said earlier, they took a lot of content from the TNG show. I was really surprised to see a lot of the things going on inside the game that, uh, well, not too well known. I mean, everybody who has seen the entire show has seen this at some point, but you don't necessarily remember it. And it took a lot from the show. This I like about it. It gives a little bit spice to the situation. It's not like in Star Trek Armada where you have four or six factions and that's about it. Actually, there are a lot of factions, the major factions and smaller factions as well. I find this nicely done. And in general, the game is giving you a lot of ways to go about conquering the galaxy basically and gives you a lot of options a lot of, of, of ways to do it and on the other hand this is also the con now I'm switching to the cons for a novice player there's a whole lot to know I mean there's a manual that tells you what is going on and this is definitely a pro but it is a little bit overwhelming if you haven't played it a whole lot but I believe this goes for many games where you kind of need a guide or a manual or something like that. In this case, it's just that you very often don't have an idea of what actually to do, what is the best approach to something. So you will kind of have to fail a lot to really have a feeling of what you're doing there. There is definitely a learning curve on this. One thing I'd have to double check. If I remember right, if you install the original version of the original game, you will get the tutorials in the saved game. They suggest that you play those tutorials, give you an idea. It's basically combat, intelligence, research. Um, I remember what the fourth one is. But it actually has a small tutorial for each 
useful aspect of the game. Yeah, and I really believe you need this because, as I said, there are many options how to go about it or what you want to mm -hmm. emphasize the strategy on. And if you have yeah. no idea what the actual means are doing, then it's a little bit tricky to, to be successful. Yeah, I've had a few new players come in and say, what do I do with intelligence? <laughs> yeah, exactly. If you have no idea what uh -huh. this means or what the advantage is of using this aspect of the game, then maybe you may neglect it altogether and end up in a disaster. Exactly. And they did the manual, but it was not really, in my opinion, that informative. <laughs> it could have been done a lot better, too. Yeah, I haven't read it uh, enti entirely through, but I believe the captain will say a few things about it anyways later. And well, I mean, on a neutral note, maybe it's a complex game, not too tricky, not too complex, but it isn't simply like clicking a few things together. You really have to think about what you are going to do, but then again, you have the time to do it. That's one thing that's, been, like you say, is nice. You don't have to rush it. And that's one thing, I, like you say, I enjoy too. I'll play two or three turns and turn it off, save it, come back the next day. You know, you don't yeah, have or to maybe do something is coming up and you really have to leave. Do this in a, mm -hmm. an RTS or shooter match. Not yeah. really fun. Here you can do it. Also, it's so nice that <laughs> the game can crash and it doesn't matter because you saved already the last round. Yes, that, that was one thing that they, I think, was one of the smartest things they did was have that auto save. Oh, yeah. Speaking of saves, there's also one called last save. You cannot access it from the save screen, but it's actually the turn before that. You have to rename it and put it into a save slot or auto save. So you have a two stage save, actually. Yes, exactly. So if there was a problem on that one turn that keeps a recurring error, you can actually go back to that last save and load it in. That's so why multiplayer, I always suggest, as soon as you have a crash, you back up your last save and you back up your auto save. Just in case. Because if there's a problem within that auto save, you can go back to the last save. Yeah, and in general, uh, the game itself is, as I said, something that is appealing to me because it's turn-based strategy and actually I like it. Just haven't gotten around to investing more time, but this is one of those games where I think I will have to look into this a little bit deeper. This is a game oh, yeah. that can, I believe, really tie you to the computer for weeks at a time. Oh yes, and I had many weeks when I was younger that I did that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know the feeling. The same and, goes for me with many... XCOM. I don't know how many hours I have invested into this game, and this game here will also have potential to do this, most definitely. But you can get addicted to it, and especially once yeah. you start getting into multiplayer. If, if you find somebody that you enjoy playing with, and that's always how I always played multiplayer. I was never one to go head to head. I would always, we would team up, kill the AI. After the AI is dead, we'd meet up with everything we have and just have one major battle. <laughs> Yeah, th this is something I also tend to do. I already mentioned Warlords, and this is also a game you can play in any way you like. And uh, same thing here. You just get a few guys together and, uh, well, play until you have all the factions under your control or the castles under your control. And same goes for this game. You can simply play it this, in this fashion in a non-competitive way. Yeah, it's like we do do tournaments every once in a while, which is head-to-head, -head, throat if you want to call it, but... You're trying to take them out as quickly as possible to win the game. And that gets very interesting also. We have some very experienced players that will wreck you very quickly. I'll let me put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> I've never won a turn it myself because that's not really my style of play. But I've played them with, against them and they will just, before turn 50, they're sitting on top of you with 100 ships. And you're like, how did they do this? Yeah. But they will. They will too. I mean, they are that good. Yeah, and that's how they used to play on MSM Game Zone. They would just do that. I mean, that that was their whole thing. And they had a group of people perfected the game. You know, you don't want to go up against them if you're going in that type of 
game. <laughs> that's in a way the danger of all those turn-based strategy games. I mean, in a way, it's also a downside that you have the time to think about your situation. There is no micromanagement, fast clicking, stuff like that. You can think about the situation carefully and choose the, the best solution for the situation. And if you have someone who really has a grasp of the mechanics of the game, knows what the units do and what to do in certain situations, then it's a little bit like chess simply. It really is important to put your mind to it. And some people are really good at that. Oh, yeah, they are. And there's a lot of them out there, I know that. But... I would say for me always a problem was that I didn't have an auto build button. There is one included. If you look at the building section of the, the buildings or the ships, there is a button, but it doesn't do anything. And I hate it when you have in the late game 10 or 15 new systems and you have to micromanage every system. What? building they have to build next, how to allocate the power and everything. I really would have liked a button who takes care of that. Oh yes, and also I would have loved to had a, you know, it's not an AI I guess, but something to designate, okay, I want this system for intelligence, I want this system, auto build intelligence, auto build research, auto build ships, you know, it really needed that. It needed to be more specific. And actually the auto button, does work. Oh. It just takes so long for the code to initiate. And it will take 25 to 30 turns before it builds one thing. It's ridiculous. Like you say, it really doesn't work. It will actually build a few things after, like I say, 20 to 30 turns. It's not really anything you want or need. You know? Yeah, that's not good. <laughs> but it's, like you say, it's not really functioning. It will build something, but it's not something you need. So, <laughs> it, like you say, it is pretty much worthless. A lot of people, that is their main thing, is the micromanagement at the end. It's very tough. I've actually gotten to the point when I'm at that point in the game, I've pretty much designated systems, the system for intel, the system for research, and I'll mainly use the summary page. Do I need to go to this system? See what's going on there. But it kind of lessens the micromanagement because I'm just basically, I won't say ignoring it, I have already have it preset. It becomes a certain point when you don't want to build any more buildings. And unless you're building a ship there, there's not really much to do. For example, I would put like, okay, I know this is an Intel system. I would put an Intel building on there, but they would have no uh, industry. It would say 560 turns. So I know I don't even have, need to visit that system. It would kind of decrease the micromanagement a little bit, but most players will tell you that exact same thing, micromanagement in the later stages of the game, when you have 50, 60, 100 systems, is a nightmare. <laughs> I will agree there, that is a very big con. Another thing I never liked was the intelligence system. The basic idea behind it is great. It's also the information you get from it, but I never felt it was very well done. Uh, it was made in 1999. Yeah, and as you mentioned, they didn't have that much time, maybe a little bit more and the game would be kind of perfect. That is possible. I, I They could have done so much more with it, like you say, if they had more time or if it was just made nowadays. <laughs> okay. Do you want to add something to the cons? To me, the biggest cons as a modder is the limitations of it. I mean, I wish we could do a lot more with it, but we've kind of covered that. As far as the game goes, like you say, the biggest is the micromanagement. A lot of it is, like you say, the AI will try to challenge you with ships, but it really will not challenge you with any diplomacy. I wish it had more options for you to talk to the other AIs. You, know, you can just, okay, I declare war, that's about it. You're not really saying why or anything like that, where a lot of the newer games would. It just has so much limited there as far as diplomacy and everything else. You know, the intel isn't bad. You can actually kind of specialize it, but it's still very limited as far as, okay, I want to steal ships. would be nice. Or, you know, and you can to, to a certain extent by using the sabotage or espionage, depending on what you select. But it's still so random between that and micromanaging those be my highest uh, cons. Yeah, quite understandable. Yeah. 
And I think it's probably about the same with everyone who plays, to be honest, unfortunately. Also, I have to say, would I compare the 1999 version and the version today? Back then, I would have said the memory leak is really a big con and that you only have the TNG error. But nowadays, those are not problems. Back then, it was a huge problem. Actually, the memory leak was actually fixed by uh, Activision, the 102 patch. Oh, I never knew about that. It didn't fix the memory problem we discussed earlier. The memory is so limited to how much memory it can use. It can only use like 16 megabytes is all this game can really use. That was basically the max in 1999. Yeah, we have a little bit more now. Yeah, just a little. <laughs> I wish we could use more of that. If we could use more memory. It's like right now, a lot of the people's main complaint about the game is turn processing later in the games, especially on the larger maps and the later in the game. I, people will complain about a three minute turn time, especially like on the big mods like Ultimate Dominion mods. You get thousands of ships out there, and it just takes so long for the AI to say, you go here, you go here, and it just takes so long for that turn to process as it gets older in the game, after about turn 200 or so. Uh, that's one reason I try to get my games over quick. <laughs> I love to start the games at the high-tech level. I know there's a lot of them who really enjoy starting early in the game and doing that slow build-up and watching it progress through it, but that's one reason why I do it, is because I want to get the game over with before that. And that's not so much a memory leak as it is just can't process fast enough. Okay, good to understand the difference. Hmm. All right, I would say let's talk about the unique things in this game. Of course, it's unique in that aspect. It's the first strategy game in the Star Trek universe. We didn't have anything before. And on the other hand, it's also, I would say, the best representation of the different in-game factions. I will agree, it is the best representation of each individual race. I think they did try to do a very good job on that, making each one unique. And then I have to mention the manual. It's very good, but also very bad. The German translation, well, let's say it that way. It's here, but sometimes, out of nowhere, in, in the middle of the text, they switch to the English version. So you read one sentence in that language, one sentence in the other. <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> and then I found a few very funny aspects, I would say. They explained how to find your IP address in Windows 95 and 98. Not only that, they also told you what to do with it. You could send it per email to your friends. You could use your phone to give the number to them directly or use a chat messenger. It's funny, the concept was so strange back then that they have to include it into the manual. 20 years later, I would say every child would have the same problem as the child 20 years ago. <laughs> yeah. As far as multiplayer, I don't know how much they actually intended it for it originally. I, they had to somewhat, but I think the thought process on it don't know where MSN Game Zone came in. It was kind of like, was that a late idea or did they already have that in there? I almost wonder if that wasn't just, oh, hold it. MSN Game Zone just started up. Let's use this. You know, I kind of wonder. Yeah, I also would like the connection between Microprose and MSN Zone, how this came together. But we are looking from it from 2020. Maybe back then it was a good deal. It was the best decision they could take. Yeah. yeah. Another funny thing in the manual is that they also included how to connect to the FTP server and download updates and patches. Something you didn't read even back then in every manual. Oh, I know. Do you think there is anything unique which I didn't mention? <sighs> Not really. I we've pretty much covered a lot here. I know that. Uh, not that I can really think of. Uh, like I said, it just has so many things that I wish they could have developed into it. Hidden things that would have made it more unique. Well, let's go to that subject. What could the sequel do better? Of course, it could have a better AI. Coding could also be better. A sequel could also be more odd-friendly, where this isn't. 
right now there is one that's called supremacy that's working on one that's it's still in the i won't say early developments it's actually playable we actually have a little forum and uh, a lot of people love the game and it is very well graphic compared to what birth of the federation is but they still have not gotten the combat yet to the game they've had several people working on it but it just hasn't gotten done yet uh, I think right now it's only one or two people working on it, so it is very slow go. But yeah, there's a lot of things they could do with different races. I mean, they could add pretty much any race they want as far as nowadays if they had a sequel. But like, one thing a lot of people really have always requested over the years is the miners to be able to expand. They could get two or three systems, neighboring systems around them, so they could be a mini empire. That was one thing that a lot of people really wanted, more than anything, I think. Also, the ability to add more miners, <laughs> more than the 30 that was maxed on the game. I said, there's so many things that people have requested over the years, but any new game sequel could take care of, because they would have the code for it. So many ship modifications, the torpedoes, and then the plasma, the pulse cannons and everything like that, I think would be really a great addition to the game. Actually, having, instead of a turn-based combat, a lot of people want open combat. You're just commanding as quick as you can, and it's taking as soon as you do it. You know, it'd be nice to also have. That would also change the basis of the game, I think. Yeah, it would be good to have both options. I think it would make it more fun. I just can concur with everything you just said. Better tutorial. Also, a better explanation of the actions you can do. Especially in combat. Oh yeah. You have a list of attack modes, attack moves, and even the manual doesn't explain what each move does, what bonus you get if you make a hit and run tactic or avoid the enemy. This was really badly done. Yeah. Or if you run, oh, by the way, you're going to lose morale if you do that. <laughs> yeah, it would have been nice if I have known that before I have flown away. Uh-huh. That's like as far as each combat, it kind of supposedly shows you how the ships would move over to the left. But even that, that's relative to what this ship does. It actually changes a little bit depending on what your opponent's ships do. So it's not really a good representation, even that little image to the left when you select charge it's just a straight arrow going straight towards them when you stretch circle it shows that it's circling around but yet in real combat it doesn't do that so it's kind of deceptive there too yeah i agree i think a lot of people have always asked me well if i choose circle or if my opponent chooses a circle what should my counter be i have no idea just to be honest i don't think it makes much difference but <laughs> and that comes from the expert <laughs> I, it really doesn't in my opinion but some players say oh yeah it does <laughs> uh, but i've never had much luck and i think it's only really makes any difference except for when you're in multiplayer against each other you know when you're choosing your different tactics when you're a single player charge attack take your losses you're probably better off <laughs> but if you're a multiplayer it can make a little bit of a difference, especially when you're evading or something like that. Like a lot of people will, oh, this one's almost dead. He needs to evade. He'll split him away from the group. And there's so many things that you can do. But like you say, it's all in experience. There's nothing written. That may have been because it was rushed out. It may have just because they wanted people to learn. It's hard to tell. We, we'll never know. Yeah. When it comes to what a sequel could do better, of course, include more content. I mean, the game already does very well on that, but expanding on the entire um, Star Trek franchise really would help the game a little bit more. Would it spice up the, the experience even more? And, okay. well, of course, improve the graphics. I mean, the mechanics is already rather sound, I believe. The only thing that I agree with you on is the obvious problems that you get in late game when you have a lot of things to do that you cannot really automate. But this goes mm -hmm. for a lot of turn-based strategy games where you have a lot to do in the mid and late game because you simply yeah. have many things to manage. 
Micromanagement, as everybody calls it. Yeah, I mean, if you consider warlords, for example, if you have 30 castles uh, under your rule and you have to manage their production, stuff like that, it's, of course, a little bit more than two or three castles in the beginning. And this is just part of the expanding nature of the, the game mechanics. So it's quite normal. But having a game giving you options to minimize the effort you will have to put in, this would be something a sequel could definitely do better. Yes, definitely. Like I say, just even as something as simple as specializing that system for something yeah, can help immensely. Exactly. Yeah. When you say, I want the system here for Intel, please push me the Intel. Most maybe also improve about mm -hmm. the rest a little bit. This would really be helpful. Or having the option to go on a really, really long build list so that you can set up a system for a certain plan you have with it and just setting it up once and don't have to look back into for let's say 50 rounds or something because you know it will work out sometimes you can do that in the early stages of a system when you first take it over and i can actually sit there and set that system up that it'll do whatever i need for like you say 50 turns i won't even have to come back to it but once that 50 turns is there i've got to go in there every once in a while okay we have this now we got to do this and this redistribute the people because we've gained population and yeah it is quite a bit of micromanagement no matter what you do even if you had that assistance i think it would still be quite a bit of micromanagement you do have to reassign and make decisions no matter what well, i think that's just part of the turn-based game but it could have been better and of course, something that a sequel could most definitely do better is availability. I just took the liberty looking it up um, on eBay and Amazon. You will, of course, find it on the secondhand market, which mm -hmm. takes 20 euros or so for the CD. But you cannot officially buy it anymore, at least not oh. from what I have seen here. And this would be something the game would also... Ex well, I think that just goes, goes back to how many times the game was sold. Company. Yeah, it's clear, but but then again, there are many old games that you, for example, find on GOG or something like that, where someone took care of it in in some way. And from a user's perspective or a player's perspective, it's the worst thing that if you cannot buy the game, actually. But sadly, this is something we always talk about when we have a Star Trek game to review. It's the same story every time. Yeah, but in this case, it's not even Activision's fault here, so... No, 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 no. <laughs> Can't even kick Activision's butt for this. No, this time, they are not the bad guy. Yeah, but the problem is, in essence, the very same. You cannot buy it officially anymore. The curse of the good old track games. Unfortunately, that is the truth. So, I would say, let's end this with what special memories do you have? Actually playing with my brother, and I was probably mid-20s, probably, the game first came out. I mean, I'm, I'm very one of the older players on the forum, 56 now, so <laughs> I'm getting up there. And like I said, I was actually fairly old when the game came out. I, mean, I, I said I was in my almost 30s at the time, and we enjoyed a lot of playing those long nights and multiplayer games together. And then after that, it was modding and getting to know everybody within the forum. Nowadays, it's missing them and wondering what happened to them. Yeah, I can relate to that. Yeah, you know, as we've lost, you know, people just disappear and try to keep in contact with them, but it's tough too nowadays. Mine would be playing this game and watching Next Generation or any track show on the TV, including a special memory I have from the change of the millennium. I spent the whole night before New Year's Eve with BOTF and as soon as the millennium changed I didn't care I just went back to BOTF and played the whole night until 4 a.m. or something <laughs> yeah your computer didn't crash so okay <laughs> but, uh, it crashed a lot but I didn't care and my mother wasn't too happy about it no, I'm talking about uh, the uh, what the the millennia bug or whatever they kept saying was going to happen at midnight on <laughs> New Year's Eve. <laughs> that didn't happen, so okay, I'll play some more. <laughs> no, that didn't happen in Austria. Not with BOTF. <laughs> well, I would say that's the part of the review where we open the mic to you. Is there anything we missed? Anything we didn't mention? Uh, I think we covered pretty much everything. I mean, we went through a lot. We've been on here for almost two hours now. <laughs> Just... Everybody enjoy the game, that's what it's there for. Get your memories back and reminisce while you do it. You know, and have fun. That's why we're here. 
Okay, then I have to say at this point, thank you for everything you have done for the community. Keeping this place alive means a lot to me. And also, of course, thank you for joining us. It was really informative talking with you. I would say this will be it for this review. Leave us a comment, tell us what you think about the game and of course, play the game. Until next time. Bye bye.